Hey, everybody. This is Krista, and it's Head at Keeping Secrets. And I have my guest today is Grace Chang. She is the CEO at Kintsugi, and she's gonna today. We're gonna talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, and the intersections with mental health. And um, I'm really excited. I think this is an area that I don't know much about, and that I I feel like the chat is it chat GPH has mm -hmm. been in the news GP GPT has been I feel like in the news lately and um, people are talking about artificial intelligence and I think all of this is so foreign to me uh and yet I live in Silicon Valley so anyway Grace thank you so much for coming uh today to talk to me about what you do um but maybe can we first uh start off with a little bit about your background like where you grew up and maybe early I'm not, something I'm always fascinated by um, is kind of your early exposures or I think a lot of the time what we perceive is possible is sort of dictated by what we see um, as a child or growing up. And so I was just wondering if you could speak to any sort of how, to, how did you get to be uh, in tech and where you're at right now? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on your show. Um, there are so many things to talk about. I think we do live in Silicon Valley and it is kind of interesting to see all of these things come at this intersection, especially in an area that I think we all care about in the domain of mental health. Um, for myself, I was an immigrant to the US. Uh, I was born in Taiwan and I came to the States when I was very young, uh, about two years old. I grew up in Denver, Colorado, and it was a really uh, sort of fun place to grow up in the sense that it was a different time and place where my parents would just tell me to come back when it gets dark. <laughs> and I remember, you know, riding around on my bike a lot of the times and just like, throwing it on the grass and running it back in, like right at uh, the time when uh, dusk would hit. And uh, as a child, I was just um, very much a tomboy, very curious about the world around me. And I think that that sort of curiosity and sense of adventure really carried over and through to like the rest of my career. Um, I think I've always been someone who is uh, extremely curious, maybe to a fault, <laughs> on um, just how things work, um, how also beautiful things can be. Um, when I was very young, I wanted to be an artist when I grew up. Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents, uh, having you know been immigrants too, said, Grace, do you want to be poor the rest of your life? And uh, I didn't even really know or understand what that would mean. But it's funny that even though I never pursued formally like a career and being an artist, I do carry a lot of that creative fervor in like a lot of aspects of my life, whether that's at home or like the way I like to think about problems in a very broad and, um, you know, very intentional way. I think that, you know, early in my career, um, I kind of, from undergraduate school at USC, um, I went there as a, almost a full scholarship uh, for academic and financial reasons, um, because my family is an immigrant, we didn't have a lot of wealth. And uh, we just um, were really, you know, surprised at how, um, I think in college, you're, you're kind of pointed to a specific direction really quickly. And my parents really urged me to study computer engineering and computer science. And, um, at that time there were very few women in the space. In fact, there were only, uh, three women in my class of 250 at, um, USC and the majority. Even that's sort of shocking. It is shocking, and it was um, a different time. So we talked about chat GPT, but uh, back then, like we had dial up and <laughs> uh, barely access to uh, the information and knowledge that we know now. And from college to those early years of 
um, taking that practice of computer engineering, computer science, as well as like study and economics, because I wanted something that was a little bit more broad. Um, I found myself you know, going through the process of being kind of an analytical sort of ground person for like places in finance. And then later on into, um, interestingly enough, in entertainment, um, I was brought on to like, uh, after my career in finance on the trading floor, helping to support stand up uh, the like the divestiture of Live Nation Entertainment from Clear Channel and standing up their strategy uh, and analytics capability for their North American division. And so, Again, with my, you know, deep curiosity and just wanting to understand um, a lot of parts of the world, especially when it comes to just like new and different things, I was open to taking um, kind of a base analytical sort of background and applying it in these different areas. From there, I started a few different companies. And Wait, you started a few different companies? I oh. did. Um, I started a few different companies, like... Uh, most were not successful, but one was venture backed in Los Angeles. And um, that was my very first experience in being the CEO of a company called Event Sorbet. We had the opportunity to be able to uh, basically help individuals book events at restaurants and hotels a lot more easily. And this was predating Airbnb. And it was an exciting adventure to grow something from a small idea into something that um, became large enough that we were in New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. And then after I sold the business and ended up moving to San Francisco, um, had another few turns at working at very early stage companies and developing product and engineering. And then my last role prior to the one where I'm at today has been like a huge um, reason why I've gotten into this space. And that was, I was formerly the uh, second engineering hire and had a product for another machine learning startup. And it was in the area of security and authentication. And what we were doing was we were taking signal processing from wearables and mobile devices to uniquely identify individuals based on how they move, how they walk. We were looking at whether we could displace passwords. And um, it was a really fun endeavor where uh, we took our concept, launched it at TechCrunch Disrupt in 2016. We won runner up, we won at RSA Innovation Sandbox, which is a big global security conference that's held in Moscone every year. Um, and shortly thereafter, with just five people on our team, we raised a $20 million Series A led by NEA. And um, that company went on to do quite well. And it was also a good turning point for me because um, this is the kind of secret in uh, Silicon Valley is that no one ever like burns out. You just like keep working really hard. And lo and behold, here I was even in a company that I really enjoyed doing, even with all the creative endeavor, um, I was feeling burnt out. And um, it was a time where I took a little bit of a pause um, to just, you know, figure out like, um, you know, what was really important to me. So there's like, a, I don't know, five, I don't know, five million different directions I could go into. I wanted to say first off before I ask you about what it felt like, um, what burnout felt like to you. Cause I feel like it's a term that until you feel it, it doesn't, it's sort of elusive and it could feel like anything, or maybe the first time I had a panic attack, uh, I felt like it was, it was unlike anything I ever expected. Um, and so I wanted you to talk a little bit more about burnout, but I also wanted to say that you're the first person ever to introduce themselves to me as an artist who works in finance. And I love it. Uh, I introduced myself as an engineer at a party of engineers uh, once, because I feel like, again, it's just like problem solving, uh, and coming up with trying to like mix seemingly unrelated ideas together to figure out something new and exciting. Uh, and it did not go over well at all. <laughs> or, I mean, 
I, one woman accused me of, she was like, why did you lie to me? And it wasn't like, it, it wasn't like my next statement was I was an artist or but it was more so like, I'm kind of an engineer too, but I think we're all, I mean, I don't know. I believe we all have to use, create, show up with curiosity and creativity to whatever profession or however we spend our time all the time. It's just like a fact of life. Um, I just deal in aesthetics in a way or uh, in, in a different way, but back to you. Sorry. I just, it was like my heart uh, grew two sizes when you said I'm an artist. <laughs> um, yeah. Can we talk a little bit about, yeah, what that, what that burnout looked like? Cause I feel like there's a lot, a lot of people around here. I mean, I think burnout is a topic that probably most people are going through or have gone through or have experience with. Uh, and what did it look like for you? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really tough because I think burnout can look really different for different people. Like I think about what that looks like for um, a different generation, like Generation Z, and it will be really different than maybe what I had experienced. And what I had experienced was um, just this sort of sense of not being heard within an organization that I was like deeply a part of. And um, it was it was just a challenge. It was a challenge from so many different fronts. I think it was also maybe slightly a different time. This was before Me Too, before a lot of you know women really had voices at the executive level, and um, it was a challenge because I think in tech and also you know I've worked in other industries. Um, there's very much a glass ceiling and there's even more a ceiling, I would say for um, unfortunately like Asian women who are perceived that if they are not submissive, if they are not, um, you know, in a very, you know, specific like way, um, your, your career sort of growth is very impinged and um, no matter how much like work or effort you put into something, um, it was just never, you know, fully appreciated or realized. And like, you know, I don't want to go into all of like the derogatory comments um, that were, you know, a part of across my career, to be quite honest. Um, but it is really challenging to have that sort of construct when um you see, know, and feel and believe so different. And so part of even starting all of these companies, I think for me was this ability to escape that construct and that I could actually fully be like who I really wanted to be um, without any sort of, um, you know, un unnecessary sort of um, constraint. Or expectation or external expectations that sort of are shaping the possibilities of who you are in ways that yeah seem seem not aligned. Can I ask you what was the certain threshold that had to pass for you to make sort of a decision to leave? I think that is a really good question. What I think that I've done in the course of my life is I've stood through so much thick and thin and abuse that um, it's very difficult to tell when that time is. And, too. and I think, you know, it is through, you know, mental health and being able to talk to people outside of, you know, your sort of day to day to help you, to help you kind of understand what those boundaries are. And I think for myself, it, it was, you know, it was, it was to a very gross point that it shouldn't have gotten to that level of um, extremity. And I am glad that part of that has fueled like the desire to want to give back in the area that I think um, is kind of in a little bit of a disarray. I, you know, I think I think about it in maybe a different way than some others, but I think that's kind of the joy of being an artist and being able to see something in uh, maybe just a, a different way in terms of how to solve um, part of the problem. Can, I mean, this is sort of like a natural segue. I feel like we've been kind of alluding to what you do now and what Kintsugi is, but can you kind of talk a little bit or maybe, um, talk a little bit, maybe define Kintsugi, like the, where the term comes comes from, and then also how you're using it for your company. 
Yeah. Um, in fact, <laughs> when I did experience that level of burnout, I was really fortunate at the time because I had a significant other who is just a very caring and compassionate person. Um, in fact, he and his father suggested, um, because we had to go for like actually a medical holiday to Japan, um, I went with my significant other and his father to Japan and I had never gone before. It was, you know, even though I was born in Taiwan um, and in grad school, I ended up traveling to like, you know, many different places. Uh, this was a very different experience. Um, and I think for those who are artists who may feel very sensitive to care, one thing that was like very apparent in Japan was that high degree of care and attention. When you get to Japan, um, you notice that there are like unique sounds on the Yamamoto line that is uh, very specific to different stops. You notice that uh, when we did end up taking that line to um, Kanama, which was north of Tokyo a few hours, you land in, in our case, a hospital that a lot of, um, People want to get outside of Tokyo, don't speak English. And even despite that, when we got there, even though we were so apparently out of place, uh, there was a nurse who had ran to get a Google tablet to translate to us what the experience of the next few days would look like so that we would be as comfortable as possible. And after we came back, we had a little bit of time to see friends and we happened to pop into this exhibit in Shibuya. Um, and I think it's called um, D, uh, I can't remember now. It's like 46, 47 or 42. Sometimes there's so many numbers to remember, but it is to um, relay the number of prefectures in Japan. And in this exhibit, I remember to one side, there was this tapestry that was really worn through and re-embroidered. And then this other area of this uh, ceramic bowl that was broken, but rejoined together with this gold enameling. And thematically, this idea is called kintsugi. And it means that in the process of restoration, you can make something that much more beautiful. And I think that really resonated to me on the trip back home, because I think it just kind of gave me the right amount of courage to, to really fully invest myself into into the work that I do today, which is around scaling access to mental health care. So I think in the, the, the sort of main bio page, Kintsuki is um, mm -hmm. the machine learning technology. I think you say something along the lines of, it's not what you say, but how you say it. Um, that is That sort of presents biomarkers that then can be interpreted to assess mental health. Can you kind of give me a rundown of actually, actually what I just said? Uh, yeah. And I don't actually understand what a biomarker is, for example, or um, sort of what, yeah, how it picks up on our, our, on our, on how we're actually feeling. Yeah, let's start there. Uh, in terms of biomarkers, um, like a blood biomarker, these are, physical measurable ways that we can tell the level of a clinical condition. And for voice biomarkers, there are approximately about 100 muscles in the chest, neck, jaw, and lips. And all of these are simultaneously coordinated to produce voice. And what machine learning and signal processing does is that it visualizes what the audio looks like and tries to find patterns as it relates to depression and anxiety. And 
similar to my last company where we were looking for um, these sort of signals and um, different types of devices to give us some information about whether a signature is unique. What is really fascinating about deep learning and machine learning in this present day and age that we see in ChatGPT is that the cost of compute or the ability to run these really large mathematical models has gotten so much more cheap to make it accessible for kind of your common startup to explore. And when we look at these biomarkers, uh, at the last company, there is a long body of work in academia that talks about this idea called implicit authentication, which takes signals from how we move and interprets it as individual signatures of like, like a specific individual. And in the space of voice biomarkers, there's actually been quite a lot of research for voice and depression over the last 100 years. It goes almost as far back as Emil Kreupelin, who had studied that there were certain aspects of voice as a psychiatrist that you were able to understand whether depression is present. And we fast forward to the last 20 years where there's been a lot more study in East and West in terms of what specific features of the, whether it's the pitch or the speed of um, being able to articulate these thoughts and um, the prosody and frequency, which determines depression and anxiety. And so at the end of 2018, Jim Glass and his group at MIT had produced a paper that is fairly well known. They had about maybe 146 participants and they were able to use a machine learning model and voice samples along with their PHQ-9 scores determine whether a individual just based on that voice snippet was depressed or not depressed. And then through what I learned at my last company that to make a machine learning model production ready, you really need a lot of data. You need a lot of annotated data. And annotation means that um, you have some labels that tell it what this type of data is. And so the very first order of Kintsugi was, um, being able to create a data set robust enough for us to conduct those experiments. Um, but even before I get to like the set of experiments, it might be helpful to give a little bit of a primer of like why, you know, even more deeply, like me and my co-founder at the time had wanted to dive into solving this specific problem. Uh, I think that would be great. Yeah. Let's talk about how the two of you met and uh, how it came up. Definitely. Um, well, I met my co-founder, Rima, a few years ago, and we met at an open AI hackathon here in San Francisco. And this is, yes, the same open AI that has developed ChatGPT. Um, at the time, they did a really great job in wanting to bring technical women together to hack and like learn from each other. And I was really surprised to meet her there. Uh, both of us shared that sort of same immigrant path to the US. And we had also both experienced not being able to access mental health care through a provider. And it was really challenging. Um, I had told her that um, maybe a few years ago, um, this is kind of in between like the um, sort of challenging times that I had in um, in struggling with just um, depression and um, burnout at the last role to like starting the new company, I did seek out uh, trying to find uh, professional help. Um, I, through my provider at the time, uh, called for almost five months at a time to Kaiser, just trying to schedule that first therapist appointment. And it was just so daunting. I couldn't believe how difficult it was just to get anyone to speak to me. Um, and 
if I had thought that were like my younger brother or my dad, I feel like they would be like <laughs> devastated by this sort of system. And Rima expressed something really similar. She had postpartum with her first child. She similarly called for two months at a time, just trying to get somebody to schedule time with her. And I think for us, it really clicked in that, like, I think for both of us having an engineering background, we thought about this definitely differently from a clinician. We know clinicians definitely want to be able to help their patients, but we saw this as an infrastructure issue. Um, we saw this as somebody like you have so many people just trying to get through that front door, but there's just not a lot of visibility as to who is severely depressed, who is low to moderate. If we can provide that information at that bottleneck right then and there, we may be able to um, facilitate improving just getting people to the right level of care at their time of need. I mean, I think it that definitely echoes my experience. I, I think I don't want to like diss Kaiser, um, but we <laughs> were, earlier today we were talking about the same thing, only um, how yeah how difficult it is to get mental health services with Kaiser, uh, even after, um, even after knowing that it is an issue and that's what, that's what you need help with. There's still, I mean, it's just in, impossible. And also I think at that moment to anyone I'm, I'm sure who's been depressed can relate. It's like so challenging to get out of bed, to do anything, to make, to ask for help in general, is just like this right. giant struggle. So I feel like this is, an amazing, I think some of the examples that I listen to online, you don't actually have to be talking. Can you talk a little bit about how, what the, what people say can be completely agnostic, even in, in other languages, it doesn't, it isn't language specific. Yeah, most definitely. So one thing that we found was completely fascinating was um, the paper I mentioned in 2018, that just produced kind of a binary result. And that was using something like in technical jargon, jargon, like a multimodal LSTM that would produce that sort of binary result. And what they were taking is what people were talking about along with how they were saying it. And um, language models are, are super huge and they can create a lot of latency in serving back a result. Um, but in the earliest exploration of our company and just trying to build up that initial data set, we built essentially a voice journaling app to allow people to vent and talk about challenges, um, to connect with others in the community, but it also afforded us like at a very high level, the ability to abstract hundreds of thousands of conversations to experiment and understand that um, it's actually really not about what someone says that determines depression. Uh, empirically, we found that when we dropped the language component of the model and just focused on like the signals of the voice, um, that was equivalently uh, predictive of depression and anxiety. And we thought that was super, super interesting because uh, one, we could protect patient privacy because we don't care about what they're saying. Um, there's also a lot of socioeconomic bias that's kind of bound into the language that we use that we don't need as part of this sort of analysis. Number two, um, because we were dropping the language model, all of a sudden um, we could perform these sort of calculations in real time because it was that much lighter, a much more elegant architecture. And then the third piece is because we are only paying attention to how people were speaking, our models were language agnostic. So people could be speaking in Spanish and Chinese and French, but we were just looking for the signals that were most predictive of depression and anxiety. And it was really a pretty amazing um, set of insights that we found through those experiments. Can you, is there, and maybe this isn't like a question, maybe, or maybe it's an obvious question. Um, can you give examples of sort of pitch or speed or the sort of um, the, 
the biomarkers that we were talking about earlier that might be sort of um, subconsciously being transmitted from me to you at this moment? <laughs> it's interesting because I think psychiatrists have noticed um, there are different patterns of speech that um, kind of help guide for those additional sets of questions. And I think it's there, the technical terminology is like psychomotor retardation and psychomotor agitation. And these are different ways that we produce sound um, as we speak and particularly free form speech is really indicative. Um, we did studies where it was just reading a paragraph and that didn't give us nearly as much information as just somebody talking like in free form about how their day was because you're processing um, information in your mind and then, you know, translating it like out to, you know, like the world and it takes time to kind of put those thoughts together. But in, in some cases, um, like a slowed sort of um, pace of, of speech or like some of these other factors that what is great about using machine learning and the fidelity of audio that we get in like even a conversation like this in a Zoom, um, that is a voice over IP where the quality and fidelity of the audio is 44.1 kilohertz. And humans can hear up to about like 20 kilohertz. And so for every like second of information, you get twice as much information to a machine that where you feed it tens of thousands of, okay, these are examples of what depressed look like. You don't need to know like what the gender of the person looks like, um, what the person's like socioeconomic background looks like, or like the, um, ethnic or racial composition of that, I only want you to just try and mathematically represent what depression constructs look like in the sort of graphical representation. So it really, so that brings me to a point that I actually wasn't thinking about asking you about in terms of uh, gender and uh, culture. And it seems like through this, what you're saying is that these are sort of human biomarkers mm -hmm. and not which I don't know why I find it really difficult to believe that there would be synchronicity across cultures and sexes and genders. I think when we first asked some psychologists about this um, I think what they relayed to us is if you have a friend who is suffering with depression does it matter if the person and your friend is speaking to you in English? It's really just something I have never thought about when assessing when assessing how I understand people. I also think that there's something about, um, and perhaps this is like my cultural or my conditioning to never try to assume I know what other people are thinking, um, even when they tell me. Uh, I mean, even though, I mean, you do in some regards, but often I'm wrong. I mean, I'm wrong all the time. And so it's hard for me to, I, it's never something that I have trusted, like my understanding of, um, of how people are sitting or what, how, how people are, their speech patterns. I remember I read um, a few years ago, The Secret Life of Pronouns. Are you familiar with that book? Not, but I think a linguistics person had recommended that I read that. Tell oh, me really? That. Yeah. Uh, Oh, I mean, it was, it was just interesting. I think it was, I can't, rem I can't remember the author's name and I can't remember. He was a, a professor at a university in Texas and had developed uh, some sort of algorithm that would also diagnose uh, gender class. Um, I think it could do race. Uh, it could do a, a ton of things through a paragraph of your writing and your use how you used your pronouns um, and and the topics. So, I mean, it was, I, I think probably, again, this is a while ago that I read it. So I'm probably, this is a horrible summary, but I thought, I thought about it when um, thinking about different ways that we sort of subconsciously are presenting ourselves um, by just existing, if that makes sense. It's really interesting. Um, I, I do know that when we, 
think about what we're building, especially in the machine learning space, annotations really matter. And so the examples that you gave of um, the pronoun definition, I'm not really as familiar with that specific study. So it would be interesting to see like, did the individuals themselves identify the pronouns or um, like, I, I'd be curious to understand that because one thing that we have found that was really interesting is um, we're going through the process of FDA de novo clearance and de novo just means that there are no other predicates for us to like kind of hop on. We're developing something that is like kind of brand new. And um, one thing that we found was really interesting in this process is as we put together our pilot study, we're working with psychiatrists who have a little more than seven years of experience. They provide the SCID interview, which is like one and a half to two hours per an individual. And what was really interesting was in our first initial pilot, um, at first, when we ran our validation results, it was a little bit different from what we expected. And what was really interesting was that we found that one particular psychiatrist was consistently um, under diagnosing depression. And we had to actually add an additional adjudication process to this sort of um, pilot study. We're rerunning it again before we submit for our um, sort of pivotal larger study. But it was a really interesting finding that um, hum there certainly, you know, with machine learning, what's really difficult is when you introduce human bias and um when we originally created our models, we really tried to look at like the self-assessment scores, but in a place that the person wouldn't be judged for um, whether it was severe or not. And so the PHQ-9, which um, was developed um, through like a, a marketing sort of arm of a pharmaceutical agency, uh, which is kind of um, interesting in and of itself. But the PHQ-9 is a set of nine questions individuals can ask to give a clinician some visibility around the severity of their depression and GAD-7, their severity of anxiety condition. And what um, we found was really interesting was that the studies had shown that um, PHQ-9, when there isn't like a human sort of person judging on that person, if it's like done in a very clean way, it can have very good sensitivity and specificity, which is a type of accuracy, um, like false positive, true negatives, like all of the little um, configuration two by two. Um, it's around like 88%, which is quite good. Um, we decided to go down the path of using that and training our models so that we would get the individual's perception of their own severity of depression and anxiety versus a third party professional evaluating that individual, if you understand what I'm saying. The FDA doesn't like that. <laughs> so um, they want like a clinician as like the gold standard, uh, which is something that we just have to follow. But it's interesting that through this process of discovery, we, 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 we found that, you know, people really are biased. And um, we do hope to kind of create something that will help shape the objectivity around measurement for mental health, because I think in a lot of cases, if you don't measure something, it's kind of hard to improve it. And also there's not a lot of accountability in healthcare if you don't ever have any measurement around it. So I think that's interesting to think about because I feel like the, the, the inconsistencies are different measures of assessment from if we're talking about like how we're assessing ourselves versus how a clinician would and then and then further a machine learning system. Uh, have you found, uh, are there extreme discrepancies uh, between, let's say someone who says, you know, I'm, I'm not depressed, but yet uh, present biomarkers that would suggest that they are um, indeed on the more severe side? Because I feel like humans, I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel like I know myself, but I actually don't. <laughs> I mean, there have been several life experiences that have proved otherwise that actually my connection with reality is tenuous, I guess. I know what you mean. I definitely know what you mean. 
Um, well, just to say this too, like voice biomarkers, we're not a perfect measure. Like, I don't think that there is such a thing as a perfect measure, which is why there are lots of different tests that are taken when you go through a process with humans involved. And we never anticipate using this like as a standalone. It really is to just help augment like primary care practitioners or nurses who go through a lot of patients. And sometimes a lot of patients end up getting missed. And sometimes there still is a lot of stigma around even raising concerns of mental health. So having something like this, we are um, seeing that it helps mitigate some of these different areas of challenges. But to your point, I mean, um, sometimes we don't always wanna recognize in ourselves that, you know, maybe we are, you know, working through um, a bout of depression. And I think it's really nice when you can find that there are these tools that are helping clinicians be um, a little bit more alert in these areas so that maybe a clinician asking you some additional questions about like how the pandemic has been for you will actually elicit maybe a different perspective that it has been more isolating or it has been, you know, more challenging than um, if you were thinking about these things in, in a room by yourself. Oh, no, absolutely. And I, I, I'm thinking back to all the times where people would tell me things about my personhood and I'd be like absolutely not that's not true and then upon upon reflection they were absolutely correct um I was wondering if Grace you could maybe talk a little bit about um areas that you're feeling really hopeful for machine learning and AI in like a broader sense in our lives I think what I am most excited about in machine learning is the augmentation element. It is that there are only so many specialists, there are only so many, um, you know, things that we can rely on other people for, that the ability to use technology to scale information, to scale the ability for somebody to become more informed about um, a particular specialty, that is pretty transformative. And it's not transformative like 20 years down the line. It's like we're starting to see, like even with chat GPT, the ability, we know it's not always perfect or right. And, you know, hopefully we get to a point where um, we can also tell the difference between like when it's certain but wrong. Um, it still gives us this like kind of, ability to to try to problem solve through things with a lot more information that when I think back to the days of when I barely had access to internet in college it becomes so much easier for like a bigger swath of population to become like more knowledgeable about so many other areas. And I think that really unlocks a lot of creativity where people can use um, some of the AI that's being developed to create new things without necessarily the burden of having to work through like the rudimentary or like the administrative aspects or like the more boring aspects of stuff that um, we'll wanna try and automate. Okay, hey, can I ask you a really cliche, cliche question about uh, humans, the difference between humans and AI, what you see the future where, because I feel like mine is always sort of in this sort of sci-fi way, um, shifting my definition on, oh, what, it could never be possible. But now, I mean, there's so much, I think, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, fiction around the difference between humans and machines and where life begins. And I was just curious if, if that sparked any thoughts for you. I Again, have not this, this question. This is a very cool idea. I love sci-fi, um, but I also recognize that sometimes like, you know, technology is not quite, you know, where we want it to be, like where AI is today is in solving questions humans can solve in a second or less. A lot more complex stuff will take, you know, quite quite a lot more time. And so um, the difference between human and AI, 
I feel like there's going to be a lot of um, intertwining, like even now, like our phone is an extension of like our ability to like connect and understand the world around us. And I feel that AI will similarly help to do that for us. And I do hope that the exploration of the boundaries of you know what AI can do can be exciting. Um, but I'm kind of an adventurer at heart. And so a lot of the risks will be out there, but I think there will probably be a lot of those people who are the risk, you know, averse people that will help to kind of look at um, how we can make a lot of these things more effective, transparent, and um, safe. Oh, thank you so much, Grace, for talking to me about what you do about Kintsugi and about how you got here. And I think actually speaking to you gives me a lot of hope about the future of mental, mental health and how, how we have options. Um, as someone who has struggled and gone for years, I, I don't think I, I waited several years to have a child because I couldn't get off of my Paxil because I couldn't find a psychiatrist to help me get off my Paxil. And I think like, especially we have so many, I guess, privileges in the Bay Area and you'd think that um, there would be an access of people to help people with mental health issues, especially people um, who I can identify that they are, there is a problem. Um, and it's, 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 it's lovely to know that people like you are out there um, trying to help people feel better. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for taking the time to do this with me. Best of luck with everything. I really appreciate the conversation. This was so nice. And I really appreciate you, Carissa. Thank you. Take care, Grace.